This is the WGBH Forum Network. The Creative Method. The National Association of Educational Broadcasters presents Norman Cousins on editing. Here first is Lyman Bryson. Many of our most gifted creative people have said that this mysterious quality of creativeness is in all people in some degree and in all kinds of work. There are, however, some sorts of activity which are, so to speak, publicly charged with responsibility for originating, for innovating ideas. Their work is by definition carried on by a creative method. In these conversations, we may get a clue as to what it is that is common to all of them. We begin with a magazine editor. Mr. Cousins and I discuss just what it is that an editor can do that makes his work properly creative and makes out of the publication of his magazine an example of the creative method. Dr. Bryson, I've been searching for the answer to that question for a rather large number of years. I you mean you've been trying to find out how you do it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't think that, that uh, I know the answer. Uh, editors differ. Uh, you have as many different editors or different editorial types as you have magazines, magazine personalities. And there's no doubt in my mind that you are right, that you can't have vital print unless somewhere in the background you have someone who's, who understands the creative process. I suspect that the job of the editor is to get good people, the best creative people he can find, and give them the maximum freedom. You're listening to Norman Cousins on editing. Creative Method. The Editor as Creator. One of ten conversations with creative Americans about the nature of their work. The Creative Method. Prepared by WGBHFM in Boston under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Later, we'll tell you how you may obtain excerpts from this and 21 other radio essays on the creative process in American arts, sciences, and professions. But now, Norman Cousins on editing. And here is Lyman Bryson. What, what's puzzling me, Mr. Cousins, is a question like this. Do you, uh, does the creative editor make an audience for certain ideas that he and his associates, they may not all be one consistent thing, I don't mean a, a cause necessarily, make an audience for ideas that he and his associates consider important, or does he consider that it's his business to find out what other people are trying to get said and give them the opportunity and the help in getting it said? Uh, is, is the editor the midwife of ideas, or is he the manager of public opinion? Uh, perhaps that's the, sh the contrast I'm thinking Well, about. to change the metaphor, perhaps, the editor sits at a pretty large switchboard. A lot of lines come into that switchboard. He has no way of knowing where the calls are coming from. He knows that line X may be represented by uh, an author who feels strongly about a certain idea and looks to this particular magazine uh, as a vehicle which has the obligation to give him a chance to express it. The next line may come from someone, uh, from, an from an author, who wishes to make himself available. Do you have any ideas for me? Uh, the next line may come from a friend, perhaps at some university, who uh, says, what are you doing about this? The next call may um, come from someone who says, I happen to know a man who's going up to uh, Alaska. There's a story up there. You may want to get in touch with him. Or uh, uh, the editor may have a built-in switchboard. That morning he may read the papers and see several items which seem to him to be worth developing. So it's the job of the magazine editor to anticipate the developments as well as to provide, it seems to me, an essential background against which new developments can be usefully considered. Uh, in a sense, what you're describing, Mr. Cousins, is a kind of manager of the intellectual activity of the time, which is a pretty high and responsible position. What should a man be if he's going to do this? Should he be himself a, a productive writer? Well, here again, I'm not <laughs> so sure that I can be responsive to the, to the question because I'm not too sure about that. 
Indeed. In you have both about, kinds, don't you? Oh, at least both kinds. And in talking about magazine editors before, I, I, I'm afraid I may have given the impression that there's only one kind of magazine. There are many kinds of magazines. Magazines which have as their purpose entertainment, magazines which have as their, their purpose of the fullest possible exchange of ideas, magazines which deal in the news, the background of the news, magazines which are service magazines uh, to inform people about specific things that are happening in areas of special interest. Now, since this is the case, you're going to have as many different editors as there are magazines, uh, all of whom will attempt to do the best possible job inside that context. So it's extremely difficult to, to talk about the job of a magazine editor in broad philosophical terms. But there are two theories, it seems to me, generally speaking. And when I say generally speaking, I, I want to make proper allowances for all the different kinds of magazines I spoke about before. There are two general theories, it seems to me, about the editor. One is that he will edit a magazine based on what he believes people want to know or are interested in. Uh, the things that, that concern them at a given time. Uh, such an editor will stay very close to the public opinion polls or he will conduct his own polls among his own readers or potential readers to find out what this particular magazine should publish. I'm sure you're aware of a number of magazines which are edited according to that principle. The Sad Review is not edited according to that principle. It seems to me that the job of the editor of the Sad Review is to do that which the others are not doing. Uh, in short, uh, to have a magazine which reflects the highly developed interests of the people on that particular magazine. If you've got the right editors, you will discover that their interests arouse interests in people. Uh, if you've got the right editors for such a magazine, the material that they, that they publish will be provocative and, we hope, always interesting. But for such a magazine, it would be a very great mistake, it seems to me, to attempt to run after your audience with a mop, or to attempt to uh, edit a magazine based on preconceptions you may have on what the audience, on what this particular audience would like to know, or even the, carefully uh, that's right. investigate. The job, uh, the, the job of the good editor is to introduce people to ideas. Yes, to this is where creativity comes in, and also to introduce them to aspects of our national culture which which they'd respond to in a very creative way. And that's why I come to Walt Whitman's idea about the audience. If you've got a creative audience, you can put out a creative magazine. My hunch about the sad review is that we, we wouldn't last very long if we did not take into account the fact that we do have a truly creative audience one which is able to, to, to take a jolt now and then, but one which insists at Did you say jolt or joke? Jolt. Jolt. J-O-L-T. <laughs> and uh, one which insists on complete sincerity. But, Mr. Cousins, to what extent does that magazine uh, audience that you're talking about, which supports the Saturday Review, we're all glad to see that it does, was that a creation of the Saturday Review, or did you just inherit it from somebody? It just didn't, it wasn't just lying there for you to pick up. Well, I think I may have suggested a moment ago, Dr. Bryson, that we operate in the area of default. I believe this country is hungry for ideas. I believe that uh, people are interested not only in ideas, they're interested in books, they're interested in music, they're interested in serious evaluations of the theater or movies or TV or education uh, or business for that matter. And because there is this marketplace of good taste, someone uh, is going to have to do that job. Now, I don't, I don't say that, that we're the only magazine that's doing the job, nor do I say that we're doing the job well. I, I say merely that, that there is a large audience, a hungry audience, for serious ideas, an audience which is concerned about good taste, and that is the audience to which we address ourselves. We, 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 we may do a poor job of it, but at least we can identify the target. This is what you're after, but now this raises all kinds of questions, Mr. Cousins, as to what an editor ought to be going further. Can this job, uh, which is so necessary, and which you're trying to do, 
best be done by an editor who is himself a well-known personality, or uh, should the magazine uh, completely hide the people who are behind it? This is the old question of whether an editor should be an anonymous manager of other men's ideas or be um, himself in the marketplace. Well, if he's a good editor, he can be either, or he can be both alternately. And by a, a good editor, I mean someone who uh, has a respect for the intelligence of his readers, uh, someone who is willing to listen as, as well as to speak, but who in the final analysis has to make up his own mind, who sticks his neck out on the chopping block week after week. Uh, if he's right, which is to say if he's lucky, he'll get by for another week. If he's not right, or if he isn't lucky, uh, that axe is going to come down. Similarly, at our editorial conferences, which take place every week, the one thing we never discuss uh, is uh, the content, the specific content of the next issue. We don't discuss it in a group meeting. We don't discuss the excellence of a piece or whether we ought to do, do this idea as against another idea. And the reason we don't do it is this, that when you have a group of people, 10 or 12 people, and you bring up any idea, you can, state, you can accept it as a maximum that the stronger the idea, the more certain it is that there will be someone who opposes it. And there is also something about the operation of a committee that makes it difficult for the others to insist on having their idea accepted if even one person registers a strong objection to it. Well, now, uh, and yet the, the most important things that we have done in the Saturday Review, review it seems to me, are the ideas that have aroused a certain amount of controversy. Uh, if we had taken our editor's poll on these pieces, you can be sure that people would have objected to it for the same reason that that people objected to that particular article after the article was out. Now, we will trust, we have to trust our departmental editors, our reviewers, uh, and the editor himself who selects the lead articles. We have to trust him to know his business. If, if he is right, as I say, uh, the, the verdict will be in the response. If he is not right, uh, we'll know it too. In any case, we like to test things in print and not to edit the magazine down to a safe, in quotes, a safe product or a pre-digested product by uh, chewing on it interminably in editorial meetings. Well, clearly, Mr. Cousins, you're talking about a magazine of ideas, and this is a, the most interesting mm -hmm. kind and the kind that gives an opportunity for creative work. It seems to me you've, you've stated a principle here of the utmost importance that you test them in print. You don't try to find out first whether or not everybody will agree. That would seem to lead to the conclusion that one kind of response you like is a violent uh, objection to the article. Well, we get into plenty of trouble with this theory, Dr. Bryson. Uh, we've stayed out of lawsuits for the most part, but uh, we do get into trouble, uh, as we Well, expect. I can remember some of the troubles <laughs> you've got into. Uh, here you have, for Even example... Even in opinions about poetry, for instance. Well, you're referring to... <laughs> An article in which John Ciardi, our poetry editor, criticized the Unicorn and other poems by Anne Morrow Lindbergh. I am. That's what I had sharply uh, in mind. And it was much more than just a criticism. It was an attack. It was an intemperate attack. It was done deliberately. Ciardi felt that reviewing in the United States had, uh, had begun to resemble a uh, late afternoon week tea party. Uh, he felt that uh, the purpose of a reviewer is to evaluate the book, and if he didn't like the book, his job is to say so, and say and, and, and say so, so so that he will not be misunderstood. He was not misunderstood when he <laughs> wrote his attack on Air Mar Lindbergh. I confess that I felt that that particular review uh, went far beyond in its treatment of Mrs. Lindbergh what the book itself required, even admitting or even accepting Mr. Giardi's word for it, that it was a, 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 a bad book. But by your own principle, Mr. Cousins, you did not have Mr. Giardi's review looked over by other editors that, to decide whether that, or not it should be printed. That, that is correct. I saw it in proof form. In fact, Giardi spoke to me in advance about this. He said, we're, we're, I, I'm doing a review of the Anne Marlinberg book. A lot of people won't like it. He said, I, I don't know whether you're going to like it. 
but he said, I think it's important for this to be done because I'd like to, to hoist, a new print, uh, hoist a principle that I think is, is, uh, may have been somewhat obscured. I respected his purpose. I disagreed with the way in which he went at it and, so, and said so some weeks later editorially. But I felt, I felt that that, <clears throat> that underlying purpose was sound. And it seemed to me, too, that the, the debate, the resultant debate, was an extremely healthy one. Uh, for a time, it appeared to be a costly one. As the word got out, <laughs> that <clears throat> the only way your vote on this particular issue would be counted is if you sent it in with a cancellation of subscription. And so you'd have people <laughs> saying, please cancel my subscription on John Chiardi's side or cancel my subscription against John Chiardi. And I could just visualize this, uh, this particular vote being carried on to the point where uh, we'd, be, we'd be left with uh, a nice magazine and no readers. But uh, that passed, and I think, it, as I say, that on the whole, it was an extremely healthy debate. But it's so interesting, Mr. Cousins, aside from the fact that it gave John Chardy a better idea of the Inferno than he ever got out of his <laughs> translation of Dante, which is so wonderful. Uh, it, it, it's so interesting because it was about poetry. Yes. Uh, people, people uh, uh, in other words, people can get excited about artistic and literary questions in this country as well as about politics. Well, Chardy succeeded in what he set out to do as poetry editor, which is to make poetry important and make it exciting. And this is what you cared about. And, th and this is important. And this, is the, and, and this, it seems to me, is the justification for getting a good man and giving him maximum freedom. May I ask you a question about the, uh, the job of being an editor from the standpoint of a young person? Uh, if this is a profession, how does anybody... Pr is it a good profession? There are not many people can work in it, of course. There are not many places where a man can work as an editor of a magazine or even hope someday to be editor of a magazine. Well, editing as a vital branch of journalism suffers from, it seems to me, all the advantages and disadvantages that you have in all the other branches of journalism. A, uh, an editor, like a newspaper writer, will uh, invariably tell a youngster starting out in life, stay away from this business. Uh, if you know what's good for you. Uh, but most I, professional men will tell a youngster <laughs> that, whatever their profession is. I guess so, but I, I honestly couldn't do that. Uh, I've had a good life here. It's been almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would hope that anyone who is interested in writing or in editing uh, would stay with it. I admit that I've been lucky. I've been very lucky. Sometimes I think I've just been pursued by by good luck. I think it's a, it's a challenge and it's a lot of fun. There are things about it that are taxing. There are times, I confess, where I feel like reaching for my hat. I don't have a hat, but if I did have a hat, I'd reach for it and, uh, and perhaps not come back here for, for months. You get, reaching for your commuter's ticket, anyway. Well, you feel like reaching for the hat and never coming back. It comes at the end of the day when you start the, d the day with 200 letters on your desk, which require reasoned replies rather than just perfunctory replies. When you've got uh, the proofs of the entire issue to clear, when you've got uh, a, a list of 12 callers, so much so that if you may, you, it almost seems as though your main job is presiding over interruptions rather than editing a magazine, uh, when you know that the people on your staff who should come in to see you about decisions are being kept on a siding while you're speaking to visitors sent over from the State Department or some other exchange program, all very necessary to the, to the ideological work of the magazine, but uh, uh, taxing nonetheless in terms of, of what, what is required of an editor. And the important thing is that you do have the rewards. You can sit down on a Sunday night after being bothered all week with an idea, after this idea has been kicking around inside you, you can sit down to your typewriter, get it out of your system. <clears throat> you can bring it into the office on a Monday morning. Uh, you don't have to submit the, the editorial to, to a gauntlet of other editors. Uh, you know what you want to say, assuming that... that that there aren't too many grammatical errors. There'll be no markings on the copy when 
uh, when you see it in proof form. The next day, you'll uh, get the uh, page proofs, and the day after that, you'll get the advanced copies. Now, as I say, this is a, gives you a chance to lead a remarkably free, uh, m remarkably also free existence. And I'm perfectly willing to to uh, take on the correspondence, the hundreds of letters a day, take letters home with me, or wherever I go in the world, stagger through the introduction, the the interruptions all day long. Uh, work with the proofs, work with the copy. And this click of the typewriters that we can hear right at this moment. That's right. You're, You're right in the middle of it. Yes. Uh, I'll give anything in the world just, just, just for the chance to, to uh, be fairly close to uh, a process, a true creative, the, the true creative process. Is it possible, Mr. Cousins, for a young person deliberately to plan a career of this sort? You got into it at so young an age that one could scarcely believe you ever planned for it. But there are young people now in all our schools who uh, would like to fit themselves somehow for this kind of job. Well, it would be irresponsible of me, Dr. Bryson, <coughs> excuse me, to say that just preparing yourself for a career, a career in editing, by itself is automatic assurance that you would get the kind of job that you want. But I... Don't is there possible preparation? Can I don't, you prepare for Yes, it? I don't think you should make a run for the job unless you have the preparation. And I'd like to go down a laundry list of some of the things that I think might be useful. First of all, an editor should be a technical man. Whatever else he is, he should know how to work with copy. Uh, he should know the difference between uppercase and lowercase. He should know where a story begins. He should know how to get the most out of, out of a clause, a phrase, or a word. But he should also have a clear idea of what it is the author is trying to say, rather than the thing that he himself is trying to sh say. In short, he should be a good pencil man, not for the purpose of, of cutting necessarily. Or but, changing. Or changing, but for the purpose of, of bringing out in the strongest possible form, in the purest possible form, that which the writer is trying to say. Now, it's also true that there are some writers who communicate best through a, a sort of abrasive prose, where they are not slick, where they are not glib, where words stop you and cause the reader to go back. Well, the editor should recognize this. In short, he should not attempt to run all his writers through the same kind of filtration process. The editor has to individualize his editing to fit the particular writer. Now, you can, it seems to me, train yourself for this. You train yourself by, by knowing how to edit copy. This is a skill in itself, how to stylize copy, but you also train yourself by reading, reading a great deal, reading and respecting a wide variety of styles. The, the, the best editor, it seems to me, is someone who knows how to recognize a style when he sees it and can preserve it. Second, I believe a man can train himself for the job of editor by developing the widest possible interests in life. I can't conceive, for example, of an editor of a, of a general magazine who uh, does not have a very deep interest in what is happening in the world, whether in the United States or outside the United States. Someone who doesn't feel strongly about people, where, wherever they may be. Someone, in short, who makes an adventure of this curiosity. Now, along with this, it would be helpful, of course, if he had some basic familiarity with developments in the fields of political science, history, music, anthropology, um, biology, medicine, just to mention a few, I, I take the arts for granted, as you see. This doesn't mean he has to be a specialist, but at least he, he ought to know enough about, about these particular fields to get the good people in those fields to work with him. Now, these people may not may not agree with them. I don't think they should agree with them necessarily. If they, if they do, he's lucky. Uh, but uh, he's got to get people who know why they believe as they do, who can pr defend their point of view, and who, sh who, in short, can create a stimulating atmosphere for, for a national debate in whatever their field happens to be. I would hope that, that people who, who believe that there are specific needs that are not now being met, or people who believe that 
they have a, a specific idea for something that people will respond to, even though these people may not now be defining that particular need in terms of a public opinion poll. I, as I say, I would hope that would-be magazine editors or publishers would uh, feel that, that, that they had every justification for going ahead, and I wish them well, and I hope that they'll be just as lucky as I've been. Norman Cousins on editing. And here again is our host and commentator for The Creative Method, Lyman Bryson. Mr. Cousins really answered our difficult question about how an editor can be creative by pointing out that there are two kinds of editors, two kinds of magazines. One, which I think is much the most common in our life today, is the magazine which expresses the ideas of the editor-in-chief or a kind of uh, amalgam of the ideas of himself and his staff. The other kind, which Mr. Cousins undertakes to edit himself, is one which one might call a forum for the ideas of different people, a kind of marketplace where ideas can fight it out among themselves. Now, obviously, this is a much more difficult job. It requires an editor who can bring together an ideal staff made up of creative people, give them freedom, keep them in some kind of harmony, but at the same time keep under them a, a magazine, a, 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 keep it afloat, which will support them and allow them to get the ear of the public. One of his phases of leadership, which Mr. Cousins mentioned, is that he must himself be technically competent. And you find in all these discussions of creative method that people who are, uh, well, know their business, people who have great achievements in the arts in almost any field, all fields as far as I know, always insist upon technical competence. No matter how much talent you've got or how much inspiration you've got to know what to do. And an editor has to know what to do with a manuscript. He has to know how to edit it uh, if, to the extent that it needs editing, not in order to make it say what he thinks ought to be said, but in order to make, the, make it possible for the man who wrote it to say much better than he otherwise could have done exactly what he himself wanted to say, and in a very real sense, in his own way. If an editor can do that, he can keep the loyalty of his contributors uh, and the respect of his staff. Mr. Cousins went on with something more. He said it's necessary to find a creative audience. I suppose he's putting in uh, a new setting, a very old saying, we might paraphrase it this way, that uh, uh, readers get the kind of magazine they deserve. If there is in the um, body of readers, magazines in this country, uh, a sufficient group of people who are open to new ideas, who can live up to William James's casual definition of philosophy, which is that philosophy is the capacity to imagine ideas which are alien to your own, if we have a great many people of that kind, of course, we have a growing fringe, a point in our culture at which new ideas get a chance to be discussed and a magazine creatively edited has a great function in serving that aspect of our lives and those of us who want that kind of uh, freshness, uh, open-mindedness, uh, and activity in dealing with things that other people can suggest to us and other people can make persuasive. Thank you, Dr. Bryson. You've heard Norman Cousins, the editor as creator, one of ten conversations furthering our understanding of creativeness in American arts and professions. The Creative Method is recorded by WGBH-FM in Boston under a grant from the National Educational Television and Radio Center. Producer Jack D. Summerfield with Lorlin Thatcher and Bill Kavnis as production associates. Next week, Harold Clorman, the director, as creator. And two weeks from today, Lee Strasberg on acting. The Creative Method is distributed by the National Association of Educational Broadcasters. This is the National Educational Radio Network.